Education. Uh, this is episode seven, and today we're going to be kind of reviewing themes of equity, social justice, and belonging. Um, Meg O'Donnell is joining us. I'll let her introduce herself in just a second. And Christy and Lori, thank you so much. And my name is Don Taylor. I teach sustainability uh, at Main Street Middle School in Montpelier, Vermont. And uh, I was had the good fortune of attending the Vamily Conference recently and the Middle Grades Conference. And so I'm hoping that we can spend a little bit of this afternoon talking about some of the themes that came up. Um, and I'm going to actually uh, start with Lori, if you don't mind introducing yourself and welcome back. And we appreciate it. Yeah, I'm glad to be here. Um, I'm Lori Ramirez. I am in Boone, which is why I'm still wearing a coat in the middle of the day. Um, Boone, North Carolina. I teach middle in the middle grades program at Appalachian State University. Um, I've been off for the last year um, on leave, but I am headed back in the fall. So I'm, I've am i been trying to just participate in as much stuff as I can while I have the time. So I appreciate being here. Thank you very much. Uh, Meg? Sure, and I, I apologize. I've lost my voice, so I'm going to uh, try to project as much as I can. But my name is Meg O'Donnell. I teach humanities to 7th and 8th graders uh, here at Shelburne Community School in Shelburne, Vermont. And I'm on the family board and a member of the Middle Grades Collaborative. And hi, I'm Christy, uh, she, her pronouns. I am a uh, program director and communications director at Up For Learning, um, which works to bring um, youth and adults together to make change in schools. Um, I also was at the family conference. Um, I was accompanying uh, Colchester Middle School to the conference and it was just a great day. So I'm excited to talk more about it. Awesome, thank you so much. And I guess um, rather than rambling on, I want to ask uh, Lori, if you don't mind, what is something you saw in our description or about this particular conversation that you'd like to hear more about? And um, and maybe we'll start with that. I mean, this is just a topic that I've been thinking a lot about lately. So um, actually, a couple colleagues and I, um, one is at... UNC Asheville and the other is at UNC, I can't remember where she is, but somewhere here in North, in North Carolina. And we are preparing for an hour long presentation at the Southeastern Professors of Middle Level Education Conference coming up in May. And we wanna talk about like DEI basically, because we feel like it's a lot of talk and not a lot of actual policy implementation or even practical implementation in classrooms. And um, so we're kind of, so I'm kind of, you know, on the ground doing the research, trying to see what's out there right now, because it's been around forever and I just don't see it happening, at least at my institution or in North Carolina, which is kind of a, I don't know, it's very red state and it's very anti- um, I don't even know, I don't want to get political, but it's, it's difficult to have these conversations even, let alone try and implement them in classrooms at the university level and in the middle grades level. And I think they're so important. So I'm just trying to soak up as much as I can of what's going on in other places and how, how it's being used and if it's being used successfully. All right. Thank you so much. I think that's an, uh, a great place to start. And Christy, I'm so glad you're here because mm -hmm. as uh, someone who's working with this through Upper Learning, uh, I'm going to I'm gonna kind of have you address what Lori just said in just a second. Um, and before doing that, uh, as far as the political aspect, I'm very concerned about what I'm seeing sort of in the headlines about DEI being eliminated at major state universities, at there being actually legislation uh, about um, diversity, equity, and inclusion. And then, so that's at one level. And then at the other sort of end of the spectrum as a classroom teacher, again, I am working with Up for Learning in my own classroom. And, um, you know, I don't know if there's a solidified equity plan in place, uh, you know, for like, uh, like a plan in place for every classroom. And so I 
and many other teachers are probably working through these as individuals, right? But one of the things that has come up, for me at least, in this family, the Vermont Association of Middle Level Educators, uh, there was a lot of students talking about belonging. And it just felt like there was a lot of students who were also talking about being recognized for who they are and and still having to, you know, to battle with that. And then the the other piece is that we've we've had some incidents at our own school. And what students talked about to us in regard to those incidents was how important it is for student to student conversations and student leadership. And this is also something that I think is really important, but um, I just want to kind of leave that. And then I want, if Christy, if you can sort of talk about your organization and what you're doing in this avenue, just because I know you're at the forefront of this work and, and then we'll go from there. Sure, absolutely. And I, I definitely share those concerns. I just read an article about like Alabama basically like eliminating DEI. And then here in Vermont, a lot of the school budgets didn't pass, like a third, I'm sure you all know, a third of the school budgets didn't pass. And some of the first positions that are being cut are equity coordinator positions and DEI positions. So it seems like there's this nationwide backlash that's affecting every state. Um and yeah, I can speak to, um, you know, I think equity runs through all of our work, no matter what we're doing, um, and inclusion and belonging, those themes, um, whether it's focusing on, you know, like the, our sustainability program or our getting to why program, which focuses on like health and wellness and um, prevention. Um, some particular projects I'm working on is, uh, is Winooski, um, which is a very diverse school, probably the most diverse school in, in the state. Um, and they um, implemented three years ago, there's this group, Winooski Students for Anti-Racism. This was summer of 2020, you know, huge racial reckoning after the murder of George Floyd. Um, students came together to basically put forth these demands saying, we need this to happen in the school. We need to have an ethnic studies curriculum. We need to hire and retain more faculty of color. We need a multilingual mentorship program. Um, really big systemic changes that they wanted to see made. And then Winooski pulled in up for learning to kind of help shepherd this work. And we're in year four now. <laughs> um, and or, Yeah, four. And um, it's been very slow. Um, but we are making changes and we are, we have a really robust group of youth who are, I think their role is like holding the adults feet to the fire and say like these things need to happen. Um, we've started meeting more regularly. So this year we're meeting twice a month. We have the superintendent, a new superintendent Winooski who's amazing and attends every meeting and just his presence there. And for the youth to see an adult in that position of power, like engage so much in that work. Um, he was a former equity coordinator of a district. Um, so yeah, big strides are being made there. Like we're, they're just interviewing right now for the multilingual mentor position, which is really cool that that position has been funded. And um, after a ton of work, we just met Monday with the Vermont um, Truth and Reconciliation Commission because Winooski wants to form, that was one of the demands was to form a Truth and Reconciliation Commission to hear stories of harm. Um, and so we met with two representatives from the statewide um, TRC, which was so cool for the youth to hear um, from these two folks involved in that. Um, so on, on the school level in Winooski, I'd say the, the work is moving forward. It's top of mind. Um, but I'm just looking like I have, you know, notes from a survey that they just delivered at the school. And it said like the folks who students who strongly agreed or agreed with the statement, I feel safe in my school. BIPOC students said 51, 51% said they agree with that statement. White students, 77%. Um, and there were so that survey revealed so much disparity in, in the white uh, students' experience of school, particularly around having a trusted adult in the community. I think it was like 88% of white students said they did and um, something like 40% of, of BIPOC students. So just that alone showing they need more faculty of color, they need more representation, students need that. Um, so in that particular school, it's top of mind. It's, you know, there's there's a group. We are the anti-racism steering committee. We are focused intently on that. Um, I think it comes up in 
all of our teams, no matter what we're focused on, we do a lot of restorative practice work and incidents of real um, bullying and harassment around identity come up a lot in, in discussions of um, school climate and culture and particular focus areas that teams want to work on. Um, and we've been in Burlington and a couple other districts, we've worked with like bringing the students together with like the equity coordinator and the hazing harassment bullying director to like deliver presentations to, to their peers um, around this topic, you know, so it's not just the adults up there kind of shaking their fingers and saying, don't do this, but it's the youth, you know, getting up on stage and, and um, delivering these presentations and then doing like breakout groups and advisory after those presentations where they get into like smaller group discussions um, and in one school in particular, they used in Burlington, they used terms from um, this book is anti-racist by Tiffany Jewell. And the students taught um, the the groups in advisory. They, they did an activity where they like had those terms and definitions written on slips of paper and they read them to each other and then switched. And so they were like kind of learning new terms um, around belonging and identity. Um, yeah. So those those are just two you know, schools I've worked with and the particular work I've been doing, but it's everywhere. You know, it's, these issues are, are coming up in virtually every school I'm working with, no matter the, um, the demographics of the school, um, things around language and disparaging humor and kind of that line between like what's sarcasm and what's like bordering into harmful humor that, that seems to come up a lot too. So yeah, I could talk a lot more, but <laughs> that's, that's a lot of, of what we're focused on right now um, in this in this kind of scary vacuum of um, losing a lot of people who are focused on this work. Thank you very much, Christy. Uh, I wanna welcome uh, Katie Farber, Dr. Katie Farber, and also Joe Rivers. Uh, and Katie, I think that you can um, get it, sort of the gist of it. And uh, Lori is here again, we appreciate that. And the question was, you know, the DEI has been around for a long time, systemically what's happening and, you know, why has it been a struggle on the on the ground as well in classroom? So uh, Katie, I'll let you um, introduce yourself and then maybe uh, your hot take on what you've just heard. And thanks for being here. Yeah, uh, thanks. I'm Katie Farber, she, her, hers pronouns, um, professor, assistant professor at St. Michael's College. And um, like everybody here, um, there's just been so much pressure and stress nationally um, about DEI programs and just like he reading all of the uh, backsliding is is terribly frustrating um, and horrific actually. Um, and so for me, it's just a lot of thinking about it at the street level. Like what am I doing in my classes that matters? Uh, who, who am I engaging in conversation that might have fallen prey to white supremacist thinking and, um, you know, lack of empathy and othering and trying to take all the ways in as possible. So a lot of times this involves literature. A lot of times this involves um, class discussions. A lot of this, a lot of the time it's one-on-one -on -one or it's reflections, um, making iterative progress. And sometimes I feel great about it. And then other times you hear what somebody says and you think, you know, um, so it, it's really complicated. I, I don't, I don't have a lot to add other than I, I, I'm, I'm frustrated by it. And yet that doesn't let me off the hook from engaging in the work on a daily basis. Um, and I feel lucky that I have the um, opportunity to engage, you know, right now engage 18 to 22 year olds in a pretty rich dialogue about these topics and helping them see that it applies in every subject um, in math, teach, preparing to teach math, preparing to teach science, which I, I get to teach both of those classes. Um, we need to be talking about this um, and we need to be integrating it. Like, so it's like, like we talk about a lot, like the air we breathe is, is how does this apply? How does this apply? You know, what, what can we do? Um, those are some hot takes right now. I'll keep thinking. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much. Um, Meg, did you have any comments? Um, <clears throat> uh, I would just echo what Katie was saying about that street data piece. Um, I am in that um, 
REACH certificate, the Racial Equity and Educational Justice Certificate at St. Mike's. And I just uh, think the power of <clears throat> being willing to learn as, a, as an educator and, and um, is, is what's gonna change <clears throat> in our practice. Um, that we have to lean into what we don't know and lean into our into our um, biases. I wanted to show this to you, especially Don, because it, I want you to see this is from Street Data. <clears throat> Wait, can you see that? And this chart came up in our conversation last night in class. It's all about student agency and belonging and identity, and it is exactly like the Chris Stevenson. Um, uh, chart on personal efficacy. And that was 30 years ago, 40 years ago. And so my, my point is, and I'm so sorry, this is so irritating. But my point is, is that these are not new ideas um, for educators, but um, we, oh, there, oh, it's coming back. We get pulled into um, these other stressors that were, uh, you know, the, the other things that affect our morale. And um, if we could just equip educators with like a couple of tools that are manageable and doable. I don't know, I'm being a little high in the sky, I know, but like, I just don't think it's un, it's not impossible, it's possible. It's just a matter of, um, you know, being willing to learn, like being willing to, uh, to seek to understand. I can stop talking. Thank you very much. Um, Lori, something you said, that word practical is kind of, it's always, you know, kind of stuck uh, in my head because you can go to, you know, different events and you can see or hear a lot of ideas, but then how does it translate into the classroom? Like I'm a classroom teacher, so how is that translating? And um, the way I'm thinking about or looking at it right now is on maybe three different levels, maybe four different levels, not to be too complicated, but one is what's my system doing? And my system is my school, right? Like, and what should I be doing to facilitate a better system? And then I'm thinking about my teaching practice and as a person. And then I'm thinking also about stu uh, students and their agency and leadership. And then I, the, the baseline is like, what's their experience in my classroom? And one of the things that I am, uh, I'm working with Christy and uh, for learning, and we just had a leadership retreat that was on the theme of social justice because as a sustainability teacher, my big question is, what are we doing to build sustainable communities? And if your sustain, if your community isn't uh, inclusive and it doesn't incorporate all the assets you have in your community, then you're not going to be able to address the big issues: racism, injustice, climate change, homelessness, food insecurity, and so. What we've done, and we have, and so in order to kind of facilitate what's happening in my classroom, I have a group of student leaders who meet every day, you know, and those student leaders slowly, as Christy mentioned, we're trying to create a curriculum where those leaders are not only thinking about these issues, but they're also starting to have the skills to present and address about those issues to their classmates, right? And then also to the adults running the school. So um, again, this is a practical matter. La on Friday, March 8th, one of Christie's colleagues came to our school and uh, ha we had a leadership retreat. And one of the activities was, uh, Christy mentioned a social justice terminology block party where kids were passing around different social justice terms and then going over the vocabulary. And then we also did a um, identity activity uh, where kids were looking at like lemons and you're like, what? Is, I don't get this, but every lemon looks the same. And then the kids go away and create stories of those lemons. And you understand that there's so much identity that's under the surface and that 
your first impressions are such a, you know, such a shallow understanding of any person that you have to start getting deeper. And then we also looked at microaggressions. So we had a microaggression workshop with the students. And then we ended by talking, doing a case study of something that had happened at our school. Right. So, so I'm trying to develop a leadership curriculum with up for learning so that we can be addressing these with uh, kids who have expressed interest in being leaders and then having them sort of spread that out through the school. And I, you know, it's for sure not complete yet. It's not even close. Um, But that's just kind of something I'm thinking about. And then the other piece, I think Katie mentioned this term backsliding, right? And it's like, we talk about equity, we have the best intentions. And then as Meg said, there's other stressors and equity sort of maybe takes a backseat, right? So, and I don't have the answer to this. I guess this is my next question. How do we keep these issues on, you know, on the front burner? And, uh, and I'll start by asking us to just have a collaborative discussion on that. Before we start, I'd like, uh, we have Joe Rivers has joined. And Joe, could you uh, introduce yourself real quick? Hi, I'm Joe Rivers from Brattleboro Area Middle School. I was, I have a love-hate relationship with my document camera. And so it took me a little while to, to get here, but uh, glad to see all of you. All right, thank you so much. So again, the question is, you know, what do, what do we need to do as sort of uh, adults or, um, you know, teachers or educators to kind of, um, to keep this equity and inclusion on the front burner and maybe even what are some of the issues that you're seeing like currently that are preventing us from doing that. And I'll let anybody who wants to kind of jump in and then just pass it on to the next person. All right, I can start. Um, gosh, so 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 many things. Um, so to keep it on the front burner, like it's it's easy to just do other things. Like like it's easy to just go about business as usual and not lean into these things. And then also when you find resistance and discomfort, then to lean back into comfort. So I'm finding that um, in all the ways I can in class, you know, planning for discomfort, <laughs> um, bringing forth the the uncomfortable conversation or resource in any which way that you can. So what are we talking about? We're talking about, you know, book discussions, like I mentioned earlier, or articles, news articles. I mean, the news gives us a da- daily refreshed pile of really um, difficult things to talk about, um, very relevant. Um, and it's also keeping after it when you have um, resistance. So like, you know, for instance, in one of my classes, I have a little bit of resistance and resistance, and I'm trying to lean on the relationship that I've built um, with a particular student to keep stretching their, um, their learning and to not close the door. So like really working on my own nervous system and my own reactions um, and thinking about how to respond thoughtfully and how to keep pressing um, is the way to press to send a follow-up email with a link. Here's a story that kind of talks about why it's important. Um, you're not dividing your students if you're reading them diverse literature and pointing out differences. The students already know. So these are things I'll get pushback about or, you know, um, by bringing it up, you know, it's problematic, or whatever. Well, no, kids already at this age, you know, in pre-K are identifying how many times somebody gets looked at based on their race. Like it's just... Um, Walking into those and thinking about the ways you can tackle them. Is it is it that you go into a Google Doc and you're leaving the comments, right? Some way that is 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 bringing people along, um, front burner. Every policy, you know, everything that you're doing, like automatic things that I'll get an email about, where I'll be like, wait, we the students have to pay for that? Like, are we are we sure about this? Like, is this just something we've been doing historically? Like, does this make sense still? Is this an equitable practice? So it's kind of like. 
Um, how are we viewing our emails, our inboxes? How are we viewing our interactions with our colleagues? Like, how are we um, teaching our classes? So it's just, I feel like it's almost in every arena, not letting ourselves off the hook. Um, those are just some thoughts. I can go next. I can speak from the perspective of a teacher because I was a teacher for a long time, um, an English teacher. And I, I did have the, um, the privilege of being able to design my own curriculum. And, um, so I could include, uh, lots of different voices in, in my curriculum. I remember getting pushed back around because I then took on the role of like equity coordinator at my school and, and trying to host some, documentary film nights where would there be like dinner and a community panel and um I'd get pushback from my colleagues who said but I don't want my students to go to that they have a chemistry test you know the next morning and they need to study for it and I was like this is <laughs> this might be more important than your chemistry test and I told you about this two weeks ago and like you know um so that kind of pushback of like we don't have time for this this doesn't this doesn't apply to my my class I don't need it but as someone was saying before, like this is in every class and it needs to be, um, it's in, it's in our lives and it, it needs to be, um, front and center. And then there was a teacher recently at a, um, professional development that we were, that the youth team I was working with was presenting at, and I was there kind of supporting them in this presentation. And one of the, I was a predominantly white, I mean, racially not very diverse school, diverse in other ways, but not racially uh, in Southern Vermont. And he is a white teacher. And he said, but I, as a white teacher, I feel like I can't teach, you know, from other perspectives. And I was like, it's 2024. Like there's a lot of resources out there for you for like, particularly aimed at white educators, you know, who are grappling with this. And there's so much out there. Like, here's a few links, <laughs> you know, let me, let me help you with this. So I think it's, it's pushing our colleagues. It's pushing people we interact with. Um, to not, as you were saying, Katie, like lean it back into your comfort, but to say like, this is going to make you feel a little vulnerable and it, you'll probably mess up and that's okay. We all get, can get over it because feeling, um, you know, like you've made a mistake is nothing compared to the impact when you don't talk about this stuff. So yeah, I think it's, it's a matter of like pushing ourselves and pushing those around us to not, um, not fall back into our privilege and, um, say, oh, I don't, I don't have to talk about that. Or my, my students are mostly white. I don't need to, you know, like that, that's not a, it's not an excuse. So yeah, those couple, couple things come to mind. Joe or Lori, do you have any comments or questions? I have just, I was looking up what North Carolina is doing right now. And it, back in October, they um, overturned DEI in North Carolina's higher institutions of learning. And uh, so I was just reading what it says. And it says um, DEI has come to represent unequal treatment based on race and exclusion, especially towards conservatives. So in my state and in my institution and in my classrooms, um, it's it's it takes a lot of courage and a lot of and there's a lot of risk in having these conversations because they're not it's like if you look at the system, like you were saying, like looking at the system, they talk about it, but they don't do it. Um you know, we, I can't tell you how many meetings and we've had task forces and, you know, it, but nothing gets done. And so, you know, I don't think the students are feeling it. Like people on the ground are not feeling whatever work is being done because I don't think it's actually legitimate or well-intentioned um, or, or even understood really what the purpose really is. Um, cause, and, and I'll, and I'll admit we don't have a very diverse student population, but it's gaining definitely in diversity in the, in the 15 years I've been here. Um, so yeah, it says, I don't know. I, I mean, to keep it at the forefront for me, I can, I can only do what I can do in my classroom and I do, 
and I take hits in my student evaluations. But you know what? It's a, it's a hill I'm willing to die on. So whatever. And I've actually said to my chair of my department one time, she kind of gave me a little bit of pushback. And I said, I know, I don't care. And I don't think she liked that answer, but I really don't care. <laughs> it's like, what are you going to do? Fire me? I have tenure, whatever. Um, it's So it's it's like, banging my head against a wall sometimes, but I'm still going to do it. If, if, even if I'm doing it alone, which I know I'm not there, are, there's a core of people who are, who care about this and see the value and understand the importance for our students. So. I have to just say something quick to, mm -hmm. to Lori. I'm thinking about you around like some of the points where I've gotten a little bit of traction is, um, Okay, so let's talk about white privilege. Does that mean that your life has been easy? Does it mean that, you know, that you grew up with money and access? Like, no, like you could have had the most trauma filled, you know, life. And it does, it does not mean that you have not struggled. Like, let's just talk about that. Like mm -hmm. that is a really big deal in the class because so many people are like, well, I'm not privileged. What are you talking about? You know, and they've, they've got that individualistic mindset that I've worked for everything I have. And, you know, that's been like really baked in and, and it's like unpacking that has been really helpful, I think, because they're like, oh, it's just hasn't been based on my skin color. My struggle has not been based on my skin color. So like, if I can get somebody who has never seen that to see that for yeah. even just two minutes, like it's something you know, and to like teach them that reverse racism isn't a thing. Like they're, they're hearing these things on television without any, any academic exploration or any research or any thought behind it. It's just, mm -hmm. it's just like logging, you know? And so it's like, how do we undo that? Will we do that? Like, anyway, it just makes me think of that struggle. Like those couple concepts have been right. big deals. <laughs> yeah. And, and I do stuff with white privilege, but I think just having in the past couple of months done a lot of work and, and learning for myself about intersectionality. I mean, I feel like that might be a better way to approach it moving forward because then it's not just about white privilege. It's like how everybody's diverse because the white students don't tend to think that they are. But if you start looking at all the different pieces that they bring to, you know, that's part of their identity, um, they might, better understand that, you know, in some ways they are privileged in some ways that are not. It's not just so black and white for lack of a better term. So uh, I just want to make a quick comment both to Katie and Lori, because obviously you're teaching at um, you know, secondary education college. And I put a link to a book that had a really profound impact on me. It's called The Talk by Darren Bell, who's an African American graphic artist. And um, he, throughout the whole book, he talks about his experience. It's a memoir, but he, especially when he writes his master's, uh, I think his master's thesis, and he has a white professor, you know, say, you know, who wrote this for you? And um, it's just like the level to which he had to deal with this um, is just beyond, it's beyond belief. And the other thing I want to mention, and this, I don't know if this is a question or a statement, but at this uh, Vermont Association of Middle-Level Educators, uh, it just kind of struck me this idea of belonging, right? Like we've talked about belonging forever and we've talked about identity and getting to know our kids, like our relationships, but I'm starting to kind of, and again, just maybe it's just taken me a really long time to think about it this way, but, you know, belonging and equity are, are to me are becoming more interwoven and so similar, right? Because whoever your students are or your learners are when they come through the door, if they don't feel like they belong, you know, then something, then there's challenges. And then not everybody has equal access to the opportunities, right? So two words that are really kind of spinning in my head right now are belonging and access. Like who has total access to everything that's available in, in my curriculum, in my learning activities, we do a lot of place-based learning and a lot of community-based learning. 
So who has access to where we're going, to what we're doing? Are they going to be able to get the same learning experience? And then you start, to me, I also start thinking about, well, how is this going to be perceived by this student as compared to this student, right? And what are some of the challenges? And I'm also, so I'm starting to think about it from sort of like base level, middle level pedagogy. How do I create a safe, inclusive learning environment that welcomes all students and that makes all students feel valued and makes them develop a sense of belonging? And if I do that and then start layering equity, like what are the system? How am I treating all my kids systemically in assessments, in the way I'm talking to them in my language? Uh, how can I you know, layer equity on that sense of belonging? And then beyond that though is, and this is something that's come up probably in the last two or three weeks in particular, how do I create situations where students trust me enough to talk about this and how do I develop that trust by talking about these issues um, so that we can kind of say, hey, this is a problem. How are we going to address this? Because it impacts all of us, right? So it's inclusion, it's equity and belonging, but then it's also how do we how do we talk and converse about this so that we all are being honest and open with each other to even up the ante in terms of our belonging? And you know, I just wonder if people are thinking about that, this idea of belonging and how that ties to equity. I'm sure it's not a new idea for sure. But and what does that look like? Or to Katie and Lori, you know, or to Christy, you're kind of guiding young youth partners. Katie and Lori, you're guiding new teachers. And, you know, Joe and Meg and I, we're kind of working with sixth, seventh, eighth graders. You know, so it's kind of different levels, but how are you thinking about this? And it's something that teachers should be thinking about. Go ahead, Joe. Well, you hit on uh, a lot of the themes I'm trying to do in my class. So I appreciate that, Don. The, uh, you know, getting down to it, for me, equity, a lot of equity is about the things you just said. It's about everybody in the room feeling like they can engage and they can be part of what we're moving forward with. One of the things that you talked about at the uh, conference was, was about purpose. And so I've tried to be really transparent about purpose in almost every thing that we do. And I try to uh, set up the activities that we do, the projects that we do, by explaining to them what the purpose is. And equity can be the things that, I, that I've heard you talk about, but I, but I think equity can also be um, feeling like you can play on the field with everybody else and feel like you belong and you're part of it. And you can work on your reading skills, your writing skills, your researching skills, your your ability to present, to um, assess and to filter information, all that sort of stuff. Uh, when you start to feel competent in the room with everybody else and everybody's looking at you and you're looking at everybody else and you're accepted as equal, that's equity as well. And um, that's, all, that's a lot of my job <laughs> is when the young people come in the room to try to set up situations where everybody feels like they're part of where we're going. And I have to be very intentional and I have to be very transparent about the purpose of what we're doing. And then because I'm a social studies teacher, as people have said, the, the topics are overwhelming. Um, the interpretations of how textbooks were and what stories are now and all that sort of stuff, that, that plays easily into uh, the equity theme. But more important than the content, or as important anyway, is my intentionality in the room to make sure everybody feels like they're on the same field, playing the same game, and having the same opportunities to... Uh, be contributing and being competent. Don, you've talked about it, and I, that's for me, that's the heart of it.
other comments, thoughts, or connections? I'm gonna, I'm gonna try to. <clears throat> I was gonna try to type it. <clears throat> um, I think about it too about um, how we respond and react in our classes, right? And the fact that the consistency. Um, is so important. Like I just listening to what you were saying, Joe, about it. Like, um, who mm. needs the who needs my attention in my room? Who's demanding my attention? Why why is it happening that way? So, who, what, what are the behaviors telling me? And then, how am I um, consistently responding to the kids, especially the kids at the margins? Right? Like, who are the kids that? don't, um, that may or may not feel seen and heard? And how am I making sure that my reactions and my responses are consistent and welcoming and helping uh, those kids to feel like they're part of this community, no matter what, no matter that they like, you know, I followed a student the other day and I was like, hey, I'm still looking for that work. And I just crushed this little kid. Because I was like, oh, shit, I, instead of like engaging with them in a conversation, how was the chorus trip? It was like, where's your stuff? And I had to like, I just saw it right away as soon as it came out of my mouth. And I was like, I need, um, I need a different approach. I need to like not talk to her about her schoolwork. That's not what she's. It's not what she needs from me right now. She needs me to like see her and see her competence and know that like, you know, we can find lots of other ways for her to demonstrate this learning target. It doesn't have to be in this moment about this assignment. And I just, I guess I just feel like I keep catching myself doing those things and trying to figure out like, um, uh, how am I changing my habits to make sure that uh, you know, my messages are consistent and welcoming about welcoming and being part of being belonging so that she can then feel mastery and agency and all those other things that she needs to feel. Other thoughts or connections? So you all just had your middle level conference, right? Recently. Yeah. I'm getting ready to go to the North Carolina one this weekend. But one of the things I did back in February is I attended one of these Zoom meetings about the new book that AMLE has put out. Did you guys talk about that? Creating a middle school culture and climate where kids be belong and become was pretty interesting. It's, it, I mean, it's pretty well grounded in middle level education tenets, you know, like things like getting to know your students, believing in them, supporting their academic success and their personal development, honoring and fostering student voice and choice, giving them leadership opportunities, um, things like that. But, you know, we talked connected to this we believe obviously but um it was it was interesting that and and i thought it was you know this isn't new trying to make students feel like they belong um but i'm glad that it's still part of the conversation and then the second part becoming you know the best person they can be um and how can we help them develop that um you know, through affirmation or showing them that they're valued or showing them that their voice matters, which in a lot of classrooms, even at the university level, I, I feel like students don't think that they have a voice. And as far as getting to know students, you know, that's really, I think, critical. And I've had students come up to me and say, oh, you know my name? Of course I know your name. I see you twice a week, like for months, you know? <laughs> And they say, oh, none of my professors ever know my name. 
I'm like, that is sad news because how are you going to create community? How are you going to make students feel valued and, and that, you know, they belong if you don't even know who they are? I mean, I don't know. So it, it was interesting. And the, the book is by Laurie Barron um, she, and Patty Kinney. They're out of Montana. So the total opposite end of the the uh, state, or not state, country, as y'all. But um, it was interesting. And like I said, I'm glad it's still something that people are talking about. And, you know, she talks about celebrating what students do right. And um, implementing student recognition programs. All kinds of stuff. I mean, I don't have the book yet, but um, it was it was good. So that, that's something I thought about when I saw the the title of this um, Zoom meeting. I thought I, I definitely would love to know more about all of that. So thanks. <clears throat> you should come to our Middle Grades Institute in June. We're going to be talking all about it. Um, I thought about that actually. Oh, there's a there's an online component. Uh, you don't have to travel all the way up here, although we'd love to have you. Um, it might. I don't know if it's going to be cooler than North Carolina uh, or drier, but uh, we would love to have you. It's uh, beautiful up here in the in the summer. Uh, so what, I'm going to be what, honest. What week is that? that late? It's June 24th through June 28th. Okay, uh, that's and, the. Uh, that's the week I'm supposed to do jury duty, but I could get out of it. Oh, <laughs> that would be a great excuse. Well, <laughs> yeah, we'll write you a permission slip to get out of jury duty. Um, I'll have to be honest, about 12 o'clock today, I got some emails uh, that folks had other challenges and weren't going weren't gonna to be on the call. And, um, you know, surprise, surprise, this has just been a great conversation. And I really appreciate the work that people are doing. The thing is, it's not, you know, obviously we're so far from having it ever be done. And I guess I just want to end on a on a, a question that I have. Uh, and then I want to thank also people for being honest and vulnerable and, uh, and, and working through a lot of these situations. And thank you for everything you're doing with educators and students. But I guess my last question uh, before we sign off here is what are what's like an action step that you're doing or that you're working on? I know Meg kind of just brought one up about like this language and how we're dealing with students. But what's when you think about belonging or you think about equity or you think about inclusion, what's, you know, like an, a concrete action that you're taking right now as an educator? And uh, I'm, I, I guess I can start uh, one. I actually have two. One ties to Meg about language and really trying to be welcoming every day in my class with a greeting. And I try and just have, you know, just a, hey, what's going on? Welcome, good morning. And, uh, you know, have a nice day, kind of a, a welcoming and a, I hope you have a great day. And the second one, as Joe mentioned, is I'm trying to develop opportunities. I run a sustainability class, so we do cooking and sugaring and all sorts of different things, but giving kids opportunities to be successful in, in whatever it is, like I have kids who can wash, I would hire them to wash dishes at my house. They're amazing. And so as we talk, you know, it's like, man, you're such a great worker. I couldn't do this without you. Thank you so much. And developing those relationships. And I think Katie Farber talks a lot about, you know, asset based education. Like, you know, you might struggle over here in your writing, but man, if I get you, if I put you to work hands on your lights out and, uh, and just that kind of developing situations where a kid, you know, what are we doing here? We're trying to make kids engaged and feeling good about doing good. And, and so those are the things that I'm looking for language and an opportunity and then access. I'd have to say like making sure everybody has access, right? So that's what I'm trying to do. or trying to think about, uh, I'll pass it to Meg and then Christy, Katie, Joe, and we'll end with Lori. Thank you, John. Um, uh, I would sort of echo those same things, right? Like I am really trying to think about what I'm responding to and how I'm responding. And I'm also wanting to um, uh, make sure that my curriculum finds ways to build, uh, you know, we're gonna do this career unit next. 
And it's all about what are your assets? What do you bring? Like, what are your strengths? Um, uh, giving them a sense of efficacy. Like you can, you know, looking at all the possibility be, about what's out there and that it's not just um, uh, to help them really see themselves as, as uh, you know, competent contributors to their future, their learning, whatever it might be. Thanks. Yeah, I'm just thinking about um, just how I show up with my individual teams um, and not being afraid to, you know, speak to the educator who says I don't want to <laughs> delve into this work. So just like increasing my own capacity for conflict and for um, uncomfortable uncomfortable situations because it's not something that I seek out in my life. Um, so just increasing my own capacity, doing my own work around that as a white woman in, in these different spaces, um, just continuing to push the conversation and also just at, at Up for Learning, like thinking about we we want to really commit to anti-racism and, and equity in all of our like hiring and when we create teams in schools, like in really pushing on having a representative team. So um, yeah, both internally, internal work and then organizational work. I wanna keep it at the forefront. Thanks. Yeah, um, so many things that I'm thinking about that you just said, Christy, that was a really nice way to put like personally and professionally and organizationally. But I'm thinking a lot about Alex Chevron Brene's um, concept of unconditional positive regard and how you know every day we're we're trying to create the communities and the spaces that we want to see in the world. We're we're, we're creating a space that doesn't exist yet, and we're trying to um, offer a different version of living um, than the society that we're in. Um, so by unconditional positive regard, it's like. Um, that doesn't mean that I personally have to handle, like if somebody comes in and says something that's really offensive to me based on my identity, it might mean that I, um, I take a break and I pull in my wider community and my, my teammates come in and they, they have that reparative, like that discussion and that follow-up and give me some space. You know, as she's, Alex um, was writing about that recently. I think it was on, Twitter. And it really made me think like, I think teachers too much can think that they're just like isolated. And they need to handle everything by themselves, but really it, 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 it is a team. And there's going to be moments when, you know, for whatever reason you aren't able to like handle something. And it doesn't mean that you're any less than, it just means that you might need some support. And instead of ignoring it, leaning into that support. Um, I also agree with Don, like those soft openings at the beginning of every, of every class, even though I'm so eager to start class and I want to do this and that and the other, um, really taking time to connect. And I've been finding scaffolding to increase access being really, really important. So one-on-one -on -one meetings um, saying like, okay, by the end of this day, let's have this done. I'm going to email you and check in. What else do you need to be successful? Because of course I'm noticing the students that are at the margins in my class are the ones that sometimes are struggling. And so they might just need, you know, some scaffold or some check-in that um, I need to make sure that I'm trying to provide. So that's, those are the things coming up um, for me that I want to keep working on. can't remember the order, but I'm going to go. I, I was somewhere in there. Um, so uh, the beginning of most classes, our theme has been in the last, uh, well, for, for this year anyway, uh, the story of all of us. And so I try to begin class with stories of folks from all walks of life and all time periods and how they all have contributed in some way to uh, where we are. The, the unit that we're going to start next, the project, it's a month long thing, it's a big deal, uh, is connecting our diverse histories. And so it's project-based learning. There's a lot of stuff that we're gonna go into. It's between 1600 and 1900, and we're just gonna dive into it. And folks are gonna get a lot of choice in how they wanna go forward with it. But the expectation is that we're going to learn a lot of different stories about the diversity of the history of our country. And so uh, 
trying to center those kind of topics in class uh, has, has been a, been a theme for me. Okay, I'm last. Um, those are all great ideas. I'm writing like crazy over here. Um, I think some of the things that I'm really going to focus on when I come back to teach in the fall is, um, I mean, I've, like I said, I've been doing a lot of um, gathering information and learning for myself, but I want to carry that all into my classroom. So, you know, we talk a lot of, I, I one of the classes I teach is young adolescent development. And I think this, all of this feeds really like just totally aligns with this. Um, so I like this idea. I, I definitely want to focus more on the idea of belonging and really making sure that students feel that they are part of a community and that that their voices are heard and valued. Um, and so I'm I'm going to be really intentional about the ways I respond to students, both in um in like verbally and in writing. And one of the things I think I might incorporate is video feedback rather than written feedback, because, you know, it's so easy to misinterpret writing, especially if it's quick and short, you know, they might feel like, oh gosh, I didn't do a good job or whatever. But if you do, you could just do a minute or two really quick video feedback to them. And then it's, it feels kinder, more, um, connected. So I'm going to try that this coming fall, because that's something I really think could make a difference, especially for students who are feeling like they're on the margins or not as um, part of the core community. Because, you know, my classes tend to get a little nit like clicky or whatever you want to call it. Um, so yeah, that's one of the things I think might help a little. I mean, I have so many ideas, but I have to eat the elephant, you know, one bite at a time. So <laughs> thank you. Well, thank you, everybody. Like I said, I really appreciate everybody taking the time to have these discussions. And uh, once again, I'm left with a lot more ideas and probably avenues to explore than when I started. Um, it is up here, Lori. It got cold again. So yeah. even though the days are longer, um, there's a lot of snow on the ground yes. and the wind's blowing. Uh, but hey, the days are a lot longer, so you can look at that snow yeah. uh, all evening. Uh, but I hope everybody has just a wonderful uh, weekend and thank you for all the work that you've been doing. Lori, thank you so much for, yeah. for dialing in. We really appreciate thank it. You. Our next conversation. Appreciate yeah, our next conversation is actually April 16th. Uh, and so I look forward to that. And again, thank you, everybody. Have a wonderful evening and really appreciate it. Take care.